thanks so much for the chance to chat with you today. Uh, so as Azar mentioned, um, I started uh, a four-year term at NSF in February 2020. And normally people leading a directorate like size would line up roughly monthly campus visits. Uh, and I had some lined up, um, but obviously by March, the world had changed and all those campus visits got canceled. And I put on my thinking cap for a week or two, and I came up with the idea of virtual campus visits. And over the two and a half years since then, I've done 80 virtual campus visits in 49 states. Um, you can you can study this map and you can figure out uh, what's the remaining state. And I'm happy to say that I'm going to tick them off later this month. So it's been a very rich set of conversations, um, sort of somewhat in humor with Azar. You know, Azar said, well, I want to wait for the in-person version. And so this is my first of the in-person campus visits. Um, but I hope to maintain that sense of conversation and um, sort of sharing information both ways that we had in all those many Zoom calls over the past two and a half years. Uh, so with that, um, here we go. So the National Science Foundation was formed in the aftermath of World War II to be the nation's all of science, basic science research agency. And so where other agencies might have particular focus missions, NASA on space, NIH on human health, uh, NSF is encouraged to go broad uh, across all the sciences, and its mission is to promote the progress of science, uh, to advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare, and to secure the national defense. So that's a pretty broad mission, but it really speaks to the role of both all of science and broad impacts. And so when those of you who are faculty write NSF proposals, you know that you're asked to speak both to intellectual merit and to broader impacts in your proposal. And it's this wide view of what broader impacts might be jobs created, environmental benefits of your work, and so forth. And I, I think it's not just that NSF asks for that, but that really our whole community has a passion for that kind of impact. And so it's exciting to see. Um, what we face right now at NSF is a really interesting inflection point and a defining moment. Uh, so there's sort of global competition across many tech sectors that computing plays a role in. Um, there's real issues of, I feel like I lost a microphone, but maybe it's just that I lost the feedback part of it. Um, <laughs> okay, so there's real issues around engagement and inclusion of the broadest set of populations. So they're, you know, sort of uh, uncovering and engaging what have come to be called the missing or invisible millions. And another aspect of the defining moment is the degree to which in a country that's divided on many issues, we actually have really strong, broad support for the importance of science in America right now. And so it's a real defining moment in terms of what NSF might be able to accomplish over the years to come. Uh, so that's NSF as a whole. Um, I often start my talks with this slide here, and you might say, why in the world is there a tree there? Uh, this tree is actually in my backyard, in my primary home in New Jersey. And my husband and I love this tree. We have no idea who planted it. Uh, but many cultures have this notion of one generation planting the tree for the next generation to benefit, right? And research is like that too. Uh, so when you start working on a new research idea, when you start working with a new student, when you start writing a new proposal, those are all acts of planting a tree. Uh, and when NSF puts out a new solicitation or when NSF funds a new award, those are all acts of sort of fostering those trees as they grow. And you can, the, the analogy actually goes pretty far beyond that, right? So we wanna make sure that there are some parts of the NSF portfolio that are supportive of little acorns germinating and becoming tiny trees. But we also want some parts of the portfolio that are about sort of pretty big trees growing up, uh, a diversity of different ideas and so forth. Uh, so this is, uh, sort of the analogy. And then the question is, what are the trees we've planted? What are the impacts that we've had? And uh, I'm really enthralled by the impact stories that we can collect from NSF funding over the years. So I'm going to take you through, this is sort of a high level depiction, but then new to this talk, I'm sort of trying out some new material, which are some new impact stories. We'll go through a sequence of them. Uh, there's different types of impact, different types of tree planting stories that we might have. 
Uh, one type of impact is foundational research and the impact that's come out of it. And that picture there is the image of a, a black hole. Uh, you might think of that as astronomy, uh, but I'll show you on the next slide how much size funding and size type research actually contributes to that. But it really speaks to the way it's a broad interdisciplinary engagement that brings about foundational discoveries. Another example of foundational impact is for um, computing research. The Turing Award is uh, our version of a Nobel Prize. And there have been 72 Turing Award winners in the history of that award. And two thirds of them have received NSF funding. Now, I wanna step back and unpack that a little bit. These award winners come from all over the world. So not all of them need to apply for NSF funding. Many of them are actually in industry, but nonetheless, two thirds have received NSF funding either as PIs or as uh, um, graduate research fellowships and so forth. So it's an extraordinary track record of planting seeds and helping other people plant seeds. The second uh, image in the middle might be hard to see in this uh, size, but you can look at the URL that's in the lower right for uh, and sort of stare at it in more detail. Uh, for the past 20 years or so, the National Academies has worked on what we call the tire tracks diagram, which is a depiction of the impact of information technology research and development on American and global economy and society. And it's called the tire tracks diagram because of what you see, let's see if I can, yeah, because of what you see over here that looks like skid marks, right? Each one of these sets of horizontal lines is a different topic area, systems, theory, algorithms, AI, and so forth. Uh, the, the three lines that you see going across are products, industry research, and academic research. The arrows that you see swooping back and forth in the left-hand side of that are particular seminal results that the National Academies Committee can show have sort of influenced back and forth across different parts of our field. And the, the horizontal stretch here from the left side to the middle is time from 1960 to the present. So this is the most recent updating of this tire tracks diagram every four years or so. We work with the National Academies to get it up, updated. So this is the 2020 version. Uh, what you can see is that some fields have tremendous interplay that goes almost straight to products and services. Uh, I think this is HCI down here and architecture and systems up here is similar. Lots of little arrows going back and forth. Other fields, if you stare at this, you can find AI with these very long pauses between impacts. You can see the AI winter in this diagram. Uh, the middle here is the set of technologies that have come out of our field. And this middle part here are a set of companies that you would identify as IT companies, the AT&Ts, the Qualcomms, and so forth. What's extraordinary, and hopefully you can at least see at a high level at this scale is the subway map on the right. And that's where you take IT impacts and IT companies and you spread it out much further. And you say, how has it impacted entertainment? How has it impacted the health economy? How has it impacted um, digital agriculture? And so you get out to these companies that don't feel like IT companies, John Deere, the NFL, and yet they all came to the National Academies and said, yes, IT research has influenced how we work as well. Uh, so by the time you get to this right-hand side, you have these very broad economic and societal impacts, and the National Academy study quantifies this at over a trillion dollars of impact emanating out of the work that you do and you do and you do every day. And that's it, a pretty amazing legacy. Uh, right-hand side is societal impacts. It's, it's, and that, this comes in a, a range of ways. You know, We're together in person today, but for a lot of the past few years, people have been on Zoom. And people have been on Zoom because of investments that we all made and innovations that we all made and things like advanced graphics processing and high-speed networking that let that work for so long. Um, but there's other societal impacts that we can have through our investments, like broadening participation in computing to change the face of computing. And so this is the sort of style and size and class of impacts that we have. And I wanted to dig in now on some more specific examples. Let's go back to the, the uh, black hole image for a second. 
Uh, you might think of that as astronomy, uh, but it's also Bayesian inference. It's, it's, it's data analysis, it's data science. And so Katie Bauman from Caltech is an amazing, what I would sort of claim as an amazing size success story. Um, we gave her her career award, which is the early career award that uh, young faculty uh, proposed for. Uh, we gave her that in fiscal year 21. If you go back a little bit further in time, uh, we supported her graduate research through four different NSF awards towards the end of her graduate career. Go back a little further in time, uh, we supported the beginning of her graduate research through a graduate research fellowship. Go back a little further in time, we supported some undergraduate research that she did while she was in college at University of Michigan. Go back a little further in time, and this is what really blows my mind. Um, we actually evidently supported a bit of her research when she was a high schooler, uh, working near her home in Indiana uh, with folks at Purdue University. So um, we are always looking for these timelines of impact. We're always looking for ways in which we're fostering discoveries, but also discoverers. And it's a real point of pride when we can surface uh, the way that we have um, helped these trees get planted and grow. So that's one. Uh, our uh, director, Dr. Panchanathan, likes to talk about the DNA of NSF being around this interplay of foundational discovery-oriented research with more applications-oriented um, innovation and how they intertwine. And a good example of that is this story around, uh, frankly, how the internet works and NSF's role in it. A lot of people hear sort of uh, DARPA funded stuff and poof, there was an internet 50 years later. <laughs> NSF likes to say, oh, well, maybe so, but let's, let's dig in a little bit more. So one of the key things that took ARPANET out to a much broader user, user base was when NSF came in in the 80s and said, hey, it's not enough for just a handful of research institutions to have access to this thing. It needs to be broad across the full set of universities in America. And that's what NSF net was. It was intended to be a form of research infrastructure. And it has from that point sort of built out in the 80s to be across universities. And then beyond that, it became sort of a private sector thing as well. Uh, you can take this story further. Um, one of the first uh, NSF expeditions and computing awards that we gave out in the size directorate uh, went to a team that intended to create different programmable elements for networking, mobile networking, as well as other forms of networking. And from that came the notion of software-defined networking, which is basically under the covers rewired essentially everything about how we do computer networking today, um, both within data centers and um, geographically distributed as well. So this is one story, one impact story about NSF research and, um, and networking. I will also mention on the side that that SDN award that we made was right at the edge <laughs> of the money we had available. It was really a case of like, looking in the sofa cushions to fund one more project. And what keeps me awake at night is worrying about what are the projects that we didn't find the money for? What's the one that we didn't manage to fund? And how might we be better off if we had had the money to fund one more project? So, I mean, this is an example where we just barely got this one funded and it did amazing things. There are other ones I fear where we didn't get it funded. Uh, another DNA story uh, is around the notion of uh, different kinds of digital libraries research uh, that was funded, goes all the way back to the 50s, the 70s. In 1994, there was a broad multi-directorate effort at NSF around the Digital Libraries Initiative. And from that Digital Libraries Initiative, um, we have in size the final report. If you're a professor, you know that you're asked to write annual and final reports to NSF. Uh, we keep them. And we have the one from the Digital Libraries Project where they said, oh, by the way, we founded this little company this year. It's called Google. Uh, so that's a pretty decent impact story that we can speak to. And clearly, uh, from there, 
there's been these sort of huge uh, innovation oriented translational impacts that have happened as well. We also know that Bryn and Page, uh, one had an NSF graduate research fellowship and the other was uh, funded by one of the RA ships off of that award. So we can sort of track the people as well as the work. Um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is another place where NSF is viewed as having funded important foundational impacts over the decades. Uh, and in fact, uh, most people credit NSF with being the funding agency that kept some of these topic areas alive during the various things that have come to be called AI winters. And we continue to work on this today. So back to this, I mean, this tells the story of the types of impact that we seek to achieve um, through your work and through us funding it. If you have other impact stories, please tell them to me. When I started as an AD and I said that, people said, oh, you'll be deluged with email. And I can assure you that's the kind of email I would love to be deluged with. So if you have a story of something that NSF funded and where it's gotten to lately, I would love to hear about it. So digging in a little more, uh, org charts are never too exciting, but I do like to show one. So this is the size org chart. Um, we're organized into these four units. The reason why I like to show this is because, uh, you know, this is a federal agency. Um, but it's also people, and so we try to be approachable. And so here's the leadership of the size directorate. We're broken into uh, three boxes, uh, the green, the, the dark aqua, and the sky blue. These three span the full research space of computing. The fourth one is unique. The Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure is organizationally within size. It has the broader mandate to serve the full scientific community with the advanced computing hardware, software, and services that you need to get science done in many different fields. Uh, so we're standing up computing resources for astronomers, for zoologists, and so forth. Uh, so this is who we are. Uh, and actually, uh, I'm pleased to say that Beirut is no longer acting. He's the actual deputy division director as of today. And so with that, um, this is our, our permanent crew for a while. Uh, but we're happy to color across the lines when it's useful. And I think a lot of folks, when they want to have impact, they want to be interdisciplinary. They don't want to be contained within topic areas. And I, I give this as a very abbreviated list of examples where we go across either the size topic areas, the four of them, or we even go across the many directorates of NSF more broadly with things like the National AI Research Institutes, our cybersecurity program, secure and trustworthy cyberspace, and so on and so forth. Um, in all cases, the point is to go broad. The point is to think beyond disciplinary silos. So by the numbers, this is what we look like. Um, this is for fiscal year 21. Fiscal year 22 will end in about two weeks and we'll update this, but this is the last year for which we have the full numbers. So size has a, a, a budget of just over a billion dollars and it's our role to give it out to the community to well-formed, well-reviewed research ideas as many as, you know, as we can across the portfolio. Uh, in that particular year, we received around 7,200 proposals, took them through a merit review process and were able to fund about a quarter of them, around 1,700 awards. Uh, so what do those awards do? Uh, first and foremost, they fund about 80% of the federal funding that goes to academic CS research in the US. So that's a big number. That's a huge responsibility. Um, it means that where there are opportunities, we need uh, to be able to grow the space in order to go after them. Um, but it also means that we have all of you to count on when um, there are opportunities out there. We know you'll go after them. So that's good too. Uh, with that funding, we fund around 20,000 people um, from faculty uh, to a few high schoolers like Katie Bauman. Uh, 6,000 graduate students get funded off of NSF size research funding, primarily through the research grants that we fund out to PIs, and then they pay your stipend as an RA ship, right? So that's the main way that most people get NSF funding. 
Um, we also fund around uh, close to 400 institutions. So what is that? America has around 150 so-called R1 institutions. Size funds, basically all of those. Uh, but then that leaves another 220 institutions that we fund beyond that. So those are R2s, those are predominantly undergrad institutions, those are community colleges, and so on, they're nonprofits. It's a very broad base of organizations that we fund in order to get those trees planted and growing. Um, with that, uh, so in terms of where the field is going and how we view it in terms of the funding, here are three technical themes that we see as important to the field. Uh, and then I'll talk about in a little more detail and talk about programmatics. Uh, the first one is size in a post -Moore law, Moore's Law world. And so the basic idea here is Gordon Moore back in the 60s plotted out this prediction that the number of transistors that could be cost effectively put on a chip uh, would double roughly every 18 months. And we've stayed on that trajectory for close to 60 years. It's quite remarkable. It's not a law of physics. It's basically uh, an industry trend that many companies have put money into keeping us on, but it's ending. And as it ends, it's not just a case of the transistors underneath us will change, but everything else can keep going. It's really a case that everything about computing systems is changing now up into the software layers, in a way that's affecting the portability of software, the reliability of software, and the security of software. And that says that we should change how we're doing things. And I'll talk a little bit about some programmatics we're working on there. Second thing is the transcendence of AI. This is the idea that AI isn't just a subfield on the side. AI is really pulling from all of computing to advance, right? It's about computer systems, algorithms, data, and so forth. And it's fueling advances very broadly as well. And so we need to think about what are the programmatics that fit there. And then finally is this third one, designing beneficial socio-technical systems. I think, you know, computing has been socio-technical from the start, uh, but we really need to sort of account for um, how much that's a part of what we do and how much that's a part of the impact that we have on every person out on the street who's interacting with our systems. And you know, our systems are shaping lives, right? We have to think about that. So it affects things like explainable AI, it affects things like social media platforms, um, but it also affects things like connectivity. If you live in a rural area, access to affordable broadband is a part of being a beneficial socio-technical system too. Uh, so thinking about how to develop programmatics for that to meet that need as well. So in addition to those three technical themes, I also talk about these sort of how to get there themes. Uh, and the two that I'll focus on from this list are infrastructure and people. So with that, let me go through them in a little more detail. So in this uh, size in a post-more world or the seismic shift, and there is a pun there, uh, <laughs> um, I use this picture and you're like, why is there a picture of uh, sedimentary rock on this slide? Um, how many of you were taught or use a curriculum in which there are these layers, right? There's circuits and then there's architecture and then there's compilers, operating systems, applications up, up through the layers. To me, that's like the sedimentary rock and we are currently getting tilted, just like the water pocket fold region of Utah here, right? So it's getting tilted, turned sideways. There's an awful lot that's changing about how we program systems. And by the way, in the process, we probably need to change curricula because I don't know why we're teaching to those old layers if a lot of the time we're programming across them, right? Um, so there's an awful lot we can do here. One thing that I wanted to highlight is PPOS, Principles and Practice of Scalable Systems basically a chance for researchers to come in across those different research areas. So if you're like an AI person and you have a circuits friend and an architecture friend and a programming languages friend, and you wanna to come together and say, we're gonna drill through all those layers and talk about uh, a whole system stack for some new application domain, this is the place to do that. So we have folks who are looking at pan genomics. We have folks who are thinking about this for quantum and so forth. So it's a pretty broad idea of what you might slice through the stack and rethink. 
Uh, another recent solicitation that we have in this area, this is multi-directorate now, is FUSE, Future of Semiconductors. Again, you might not initially see yourself in this, but I hope you will step back and, and maybe rethink that. So this is for everyone from computing, engineering, and materials to come together and to think really broadly. Maybe there's entirely new technologies. How would DNA storage change something you want to do? Um, to basically think across these layers and to co-design across a really rich set of layers, um, including uh, improving fabrication access as well. So FUSE is already out. It's had its first deadline, and we hope to have another deadline in about a year. Uh, so that's one. Second one is this transcendence of AI. And uh, there's an awful lot of different angles I could take on this. So about half of SIZE's research budget goes to what we call core funding, which is just every good idea that comes into our core programs can get funded general across all topic areas. And an awful lot of our AI funding is through the core. So these are, if it's, a, if it's uh, under 600K, there's no deadline, just come in with your good ideas. If it's between 600K and 1.2 million, there's a deadline once a year, come in with your good ideas. So we fund a lot through these very broad and general programs, but we also have additional more focused AI investments as well. And so uh, one thing to note is that NSF is the nation's largest non-defense federal funder of AI research. There's some qualifiers in there, so let me unpack that. Non-defense means DARPA doesn't give their numbers, so we don't know what they are. Uh, federal means uh, industry might be spending more on research. We don't know that. But for the federal government, for the non-defense part of the federal government, NSF invests about $700 million a year in AI research. And a lot of that comes out of the size directorate. And a lot of that comes through our core, but I'll talk about some other things that we do. So uh, in this broad sort of AI plus data science space, uh, we just started the next round of what are called tripods awards. These are transdisciplinary research in data science. So two new data science awards one around uh, sort of the intersection of CS, electrical engineering, econ, and law, and the other one around a sort of responsible learning uh, and core uh, methods in data science, including education. Uh, so this is one example. These are fairly large scale investments. Another example is we just recently uh, did a set of Fairness in AI awards. I think they went out this week or last week. Um, another $10 million of awards across a really broad set of application areas. So how do we manage uh, accessible speech recognition? How do we manage economic models of fairness? How do we manage um, uh, mapping out school district assignments and, and kids? It's really broad and some application oriented and some more foundational. A third and large scale investment that we make that's related to this theme are the National AI Research Institutes. Uh, so what am I showing here? This is a map of the US where each of the colored stars represents the lead university for the 18 AI Research Institutes that we currently fund. Each AI Research Institute is a $20 million program uh, in which one lead university and usually around a dozen additional universities gets funded to follow a different theme in AI. Uh, so for example, uh, this red star here is the University of Oklahoma leading an AI institute on trustworthy AI for weather, climate, and coastal oceanography. So it's AI meets something, um, and they have some partners. Each square is a funded partner institution. And what you can imagine is if you're going to talk about coastal oceanography and you're in Oklahoma, you probably need some partners. And so indeed, they, you can find red squares in other coastal regions as well. They also have uh, unfunded partners, which include things like other federal agencies. The, the NOAA, which does the National Weather Service and so forth, is an unfunded partner. Um, another example is uh, this uh, gold square, this gold star. Uh, in Illinois is an AI Institute in Precision Agriculture, and you can find a whole set of additional uh, gold squares, including Tuskegee University down here, and gold circles, that's John Deere up just north of Urbana uh, as an unfunded partner on that. 
Some of these AI institutes are sort of coast to coast. Other ones are more regionally focused like this AI Institute led by Iowa State. Overall, this is now spanning 40 states and we have another set of proposals that are currently in review. Um, I, I've been to all 50 states and you heard me say that I've done virtual visits in 49 states. I have a natural inclination to tick states off and it would be nice to get all 50 states covered, not just because of that inclination, but also because we know there's talent everywhere and we wanna pull that talent and pull those ideas together. Uh, and so this is one of the things that we are uh, working hard on. But if we go beyond those AI institutes, we have to think about how they might uh, interconnect even more effectively. And so what are we doing here? Each one of these red solar system things is an AI institute, the lead and its funded partners. So we have those sort of 18 AI institutes here as the solar system. We've also funded this sky blue oval called a virtual organization that seeks to sew them together so they can cross pollinate, right? There could be ideas that come out of the AI Institute on climate that are really important to the AI Institutes on agriculture and vice versa, right? So we wanna make sure they talk to each other. Uh, we also wanna make sure that there are um, on-ramps from uh, other kinds of institutions into these AI Institutes and we're uh, stay tuned, but there should be a solicitation real soon on that. And we wanted to engage in international partnerships as well. So here are a couple international partnerships that are uh, in one case still live, the other case, the deadline has passed. So up here, we invited each AI Institute to come forward with an idea of a country they wanted to partner with and why. And we've been funding supplements for that. Down here, this is for everyone and this is still live. If you want to partner with a Canadian colleague on something related to either AI or in this case, quantum, you can do so. You write a proposal with your Canadian colleague and it gets reviewed by only one agency, but then the US side of it gets funded by NSF and the Canadian side of it gets funded by NSERC. So we're trying to do more and more of these international partnerships because we know that you, you collaborate internationally and we'd like to make sure the mechanisms work for that. And in particular, you only get reviewed once. It's not like you have to be liked by both the US and Canada for your idea to get funded. You only have to be liked once for it to work. Uh, moving beyond that, some of the conversations I had today really surfaced this notion that actually um, AI, data science, formal methods, there's a whole sort of set of computational techniques that are not just helping science, but they're actually fundamentally reshaping how science occurs. What does the scientific method for 2040 look like? And that's super interesting. So it's not just checking hypothesis through sort of data analysis, but what if you could use uh, computational techniques, generate hypotheses. So this is a concept that we've been discussing heavily inside NSF towards future funding that would be across several directorates with this idea of using computing not just AI, but more broadly computing as a, as a broad toolkit on which to build new scientific techniques overall. Okay, uh, we're progressing. Uh, beneficial socio-technical systems. I could do a whole hour here. I'm not going to. Um, connectivity matters a lot. We have investments in low cost internet. We have investments in smart connected communities. We have these amazing investments in a program called Civic Innovation Challenge that I would really encourage you to go and look at because it's so inspiring. I'm going to talk about one thing, one slide in this area that I could give a whole hour on. And that one slide is about uh, computing's role in sustainability. Uh, and I, we see it in two directions here. So one direction, which is to say the, the arrow that goes from left to right, is about recognizing uh, how to clean up our own house, if you will. It's saying computing uses as much energy and has the carbon footprint and the sustainability impact of many not so small countries, right? And so we need to clean up our own house and think uh, about uh, how to make our own field more sustainable. That has different implications. So I can look out and I can see a few people who, including myself, who've worked on power efficient computing over the years, right? 
Um, and so when I think about this, I, I start there, but my colleagues keep reminding me that it goes way beyond that because there's e-waste, um, there's actually the energy efficiency of the design and fabrication process before you even get into using your phone and so on and so forth. So there's a full life cycle set of issues here. We have a dear colleague letter that's already out. You can read it at that URL um, that invites proposals in this area and we hope to have more soon. On the So that's, that's sustainability in computing. The other direction is how can computing help with sustainability more broadly? And this is even, even wider open, right? So this is recognizing that if we zoom instead of someone flying there, we use some computing carbon footprint, but we save on the flying carbon footprint. You can apply that to logistics. You can apply that to a range of different issues. Uh, and so there's a, a bunch of places where our investments include aspects of that as well. And you should see more. Okay, so those were the three technical themes. Now we're gonna get into infrastructure. Uh, and this is sort of how can we get this research done? Uh, and the A number one thing I wanna get across is, I remember reading a blog piece around four or five years ago that I, I just, I haven't gotten over it yet. Um, it was someone from our field saying that our field didn't really need infrastructure. And I was like, what? You know. How many of us have watched our colleagues leave universities and go elsewhere so that they can have access to data? That's one form of infrastructure. Uh, our field needs infrastructure. Uh, when it comes to the different themes that I've talked about today, each one of them has infrastructure needs. So if you're in the sort of hardware and system side of things, it would ha probably help you to be able to fab prototypes. And, NSF is trying to be more helpful in terms of getting you the access and the supplement awards to do that. We also have access to quantum computing prototype platforms as well. Uh, AI, tons of need for data repositories at scale, and then designing beneficial socio-technical systems. There's needs around wireless connectivity and other forms of test beds and prototyping as well. Um, I hope that you'll go and look at opportunities to propose into these programs to become a PI who leads an infrastructure project. But I'm also gonna talk about infrastructure that already exists that you can think about as an extension of your lab. In particular, here's my happily crowded uh, graph. Uh, so what is this? This is a whole range of resources and test beds. They exist, you can use them, okay? So I'm gonna talk about some quickly. Uh, and happy to field more questions. The, I'll start down here. Frontera is the largest supercomputer on an academic campus in the US. Uh, it was pivotal to the computation that led to the imaging of the black hole that I started this talk with. Um, you can use it, you can get allocations on it, you can use it for your science. Um, there's a range of other ones that are called innovat innovation class systems that our OAC, our Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure also stands up for different purposes. Uh, these sky blue ones, Powder, Ara, Arapaw, Cosmos, these are all advanced wireless test beds. If you wanna test something out that has to do with 5G and beyond, MIMO, drones, and so forth, there's test beds that you can log into and you can use remotely from anywhere. Um, and finally, uh, I really want to put in a pitch for Cloud Bank. Uh, I'm going to skip through this in the interest of time, but advancedwireless.org is the email is the URL for that. Cloud Bank. Uh, in a nutshell, you should be using Cloud Bank. <laughs> so, what is Cloud Bank? I'm guessing that most of you are using commercial cloud for at least a bit of your research. Uh, that is, you know, Amazon EC2 or other resources on the commercial cloud. Cloud Bank is. Uh, an NSF funded effort to give a front door that basically says you put some commercial cloud um, into your NSF budget. When that NSF award gets funded, uh, those credits go straight to Cloud Bank and they're held for you there. And then your students or you know, can use uh, those commercial cloud resources through Cloud Bank um, on any of the platforms. So why would you do this rather than giving your students a credit card? Uh, the main reason is that this uh, funding mechanism 
means that there's no indirect cost. It goes straight from NSF to CloudBank. So it's roughly a 50% discount, um, which is non-trivial. We're also working on making the CloudBank funding mechanism more nimble. So it's not just when you apply for a grant, but any time during the grant. And um, we are starting now, as we see more and more usage of CloudBank, we're starting to be able to negotiate scale discounts from the commercial cloud providers as well. Uh, I wanted to get the word out about POSE, Pathways to Enable Open Source Ecosystems. So this is about taking your open source results and building a community around them. I'm happy to field questions about that. Uh, but I did wanna to get to people. Um, so we can't, we have big problems to solve. We have big opportunities to go after and we can't succeed on them using only a small fraction of the population. Um, the best example, well, one of the examples I like to give because it's, I think, fairly concrete, and some of you have already heard it today, is the peak percentage of women graduating with an undergraduate degree in computing in America was 1985. That's me. I shouldn't be the peak now, right? Uh, can we all agree that I shouldn't be the peak? I'm too old for that. Uh, <laughs> So we need to work on this. And I think I give that example because it, it reminds people that we can't just wait for this to sort out. We're not on an upward trajectory. And if we wait long enough, it'll just sort out. We need to work on it. Uh, and so that's what this is about. And I give that example because it's sort of concrete to me and my gray hair, but we could give other examples, right? We're severely underrepresented in many demographic groups. So what are we doing about it? Uh, let me give some impact stories as well as some opportunities for funding. So this is an impact story I'm super proud of. About 10 years ago, we looked at the of who was taking advanced placement computer science exams in America and around the world. And it was astonishing. People were taking AP Calculus, AP Economics, AP Statistics. You know what they weren't taking? AP CS. Like they were not taking it 10 years ago. and. Uh, a CS exam existed, but it was fairly coding oriented, right? So NSF funded the college board to create a new APC principles exam and funded some organizations to develop curricula to go with that exam. And over the years, so in 2017, this exam got launched. It was the largest launch in AP exam history. And over the five years since then, the college board has studied the results. And the results are astonishing. Uh, over 100,000 students took that exam in 2020. Uh, the students who take APCS principles are 3x more likely to major in computer science in college. And uh, the more underrepresented the demographic group, the more impressive is the sticking power. Women and Hispanic students are way more likely to stick through if they've taken this exam. So this is, to me, a great example of we funded strategically to provide a North Star for a whole bunch of K through 12 programs to orient around, and we're changing the face of computing as a result. Another one, the Loop Alliance. So this is about the other end, if you will, of the, of the career pathway. This is about looking at where professors come from. And if there are relatively, the, the, the sad reality is that there's relatively few schools that are producing most of the professors for CS in America. And as such, if we can change the demographics at those schools, we can make a huge change in the professoriate. That's the thesis statement of this uh, investment effort. Uh, so it looks at uh, increasing exposure to academic careers of the institutions that have good diversity. It looks at increasing the retention of diverse undergraduates um, at institutions that send students to graduate school. And it looks at increasing the diversity of PhD graduates at these schools that are the main feeder pathways into our professoriate. So it's another example. This one's uh, a little bit um, earlier in its work, so we'll see what the impact is, but it really seeks to be strategic about going after some of the issues that we see in the professoriate. Um, in terms of BPC, broadening participation in computing, uh, We've established, SIZE has established 12, what are called BPC alliances since 2006.
These are large scale efforts to broaden participation in computing. Um, I've personally benefited from them. Uh, many of us have. And you can see that they cover a wide set of different um, efforts. Uh, African-American mentoring, access computing is about um, improving accessibility. So visual and hearing impaired and so forth, accessibility for the community uh, and across many different demographics as well. I'm gonna, and Kasi is a particularly amazing story for Hispanic serving, serving institutions. Uh, okay. BPC plans is the last thing that I wanted to get through today. Uh, so about 10 years ago, size took a look at where we were and wrote a strategic plan about broadening participation in computing. And one of the key aspects of that strategic plan was recognizing that we needed to all work on it. Um, so I, I don't want to be the peak percentage of women in computing much longer. Uh, so we need to all work on moving that needle. And one of the ideas that was proposed was to ask every single researcher who submits a proposal of 600K or greater to NSF to provide a BPC plan with that proposal. Great idea, lots of people added. There's 20,000 people getting funded. Surely this would be a lot of good ideas. Uh, we're a little worried about that though, right? Um, if everyone has good ideas, but they're kind of jumbled, it's not clear we'll all be pushing on the needle in the same direction to move it in a useful way. Uh, so what else did we do? We asked, we, we funded a set of resources that people can plug into. And so by providing these resources that people can plug into, instead of that jumble of BPC plans, we instead can get more aligned efforts. So what are the resources? They're at this bpcnet.org. There's a set of national resources, many of which are provided by those BPC alliances on the previous slide. Um, that a, a proposer can say, I'm going to send X students towards this program. I'm going to send X dollars towards this program. Uh, but there's also department and campus level resources where we are offering help with departments and campuses writing BPC plans that individual PIs can plug into. And so the idea is, again, provide North Stars that help people orient so that there's actual impact. Uh, one more thing that I need for everyone to know about is the CS Grad for US Fellowship Program. It is the best fellowship program that not enough people apply to and not enough people know about. So please um, help share the word. So what is this? This recognizes that not enough uh, students who come out of our undergraduate programs actually know about or consider graduate careers. They all take the big left turn and go off towards industry and who can blame them? Salaries are huge, but eventually some of them might wanna come back. And we wanna make sure that they know there are opportunities to get mentoring and support so that they do consider coming back. And that's what this fellowship program is about. Three years of support towards a doctoral degree, but also a year of mentoring that helps people know about graduate school and, and know about how to apply. And in particular, this is for folks who are not currently in a degree program. So this is to, to try to bring back folks from industry. Uh, so with that, I, I know that was quite a uh, cavalcade of impact stories and programs, but I um, am happy now to field questions or have a discussion. Um, and it's my tree again. Thanks very much for your time and attention. <laughs> Um, one is about the size of awards. So, the size study the cost effectiveness of small or small award awards, and um, you can comment on how, this, how the, the distribution of funds is also flexible to those compromises. That's a great question. So, the, in case it didn't get picked up on the mic, the question is about the, the sort of balance of small, medium, and large rewards and the different programmatic design questions and then how we evaluate it. Um, so here's a few examples. So uh, we recently shifted from 
small being 500K and down to small being 600K and down. So we adjusted the budget limit of what a size small looks like. That was done based on analyzing um, the awards, uh, analyzing how close we were to different um, budget limits in the awards we were making, uh, analyzing uh, how long it took for people to spend out their awards. Were they spending them out in three years? Were they asking for no cost extensions and so forth? Um, and it, it also to some degree has to do with, uh, quite honestly, a, a question of if we make size smalls bigger, does that mean we're funding fewer of them, right? So there's some questions there as well. Um, we did another analysis for career awards. So for example, we were noticing that different directorates at NSF had different guidance about what a career budget should look like. And um, so we did some analysis there and tried to make sure that our guidance was sort of fair and up to date. I, I think another thing that people are often asking when they ask this question is about the balance of those kinds of awards against the big center scale efforts like an AI Institute. And there I can just go back to that number. About half of our budget goes to the core. So those smalls and mediums are half our budget. So while it's sort of flashy to talk about AI Institutes, they are not um, as much of our budget as that core part of the funding. And I think the rationale for that is that we have tremendous success stories that have emanated out of our core over the years. Another just amazing treasure chest has been the Expeditions in Computing program, which sits at that sort of, it's buried over the years, it's now 15 million, but that over the years, I think it's gone from eight to 15 million. And uh, I could talk to you all day about impact stories that have come out of Expeditions in Computing. It's extraordinary. Uh, so we are trying to think about how to span between small, medium, and expeditions, think about something that sits between those two and think about things that are a little more um, size wide. I think one of the concerns uh, I personally have is that when people write to the smalls and mediums, they tend to focus within a particular topic area. And we often wanna make sure that they have the ability to write more generally. But do we analyze it? Yes. Uh, and we try to come up with programmatic designs that uh, cover the space so that there's some that are big awards and some that are small awards. And we also increasingly are coming up with a, award mechanisms that are targeted to, to different communities. So for example, we have a CRII award for non-R1s. And that's the way it's written to, to sort of touch a different part of the community. Expand QISE is a new program that we have um, it's NSF-wide, and it's aimed at schools that have less than $5 million of active quantum research. So that's, you can be an R1, you can be an R2, whatever. It's aimed at quantifying and broadening who gets engaged in quantum. So there's a range of design things that we do, and we do try to analyze it. Analyzing long-term impact out of grants is, uh, that's a data science problem I would welcome help on, um, but we try to do what we can. Well, it looks like you know, you've gotten into, you, you like to catalog the impact stories and all that. I suspect that uh, Katie, as a high school student, was probably supported by a relatively small award to some one Purdue faculty member, you know, and the Michigan award might also be that too. I mean, I'm kind of surprised by half, because half, I would say only half is too small given the much larger number of awards. Um, so it's half in our core. Uh, keep in mind that a, roughly a quarter of our budget is OAC, and OAC has this different mission. So OAC is about cyber infrastructure for the full scientific community. So when I say half of our core, it's it's, it's closer to say half of three quarters. So can I can I call that two thirds? <laughs> uh, another question. Uh, can you follow down the road of NSF funding for science? Would you be funding more influence fellowships? Because there's a local development angle. Would you be funding more research programs? What's the sure. Program? Sure, that's great. So it's the Chips and Science Act. And so it literally has a chip side and a science side. We were 
trying to joke about it being the Chips and Salsa Act, but they didn't get their acronym together. So let's talk about both sides separately. So on the chips side, uh, there are real appropriations and it's around kind of re-onshoring an American semiconductor industry, not just including the manufacturing, although that's a big focus, but also the design ecosystem that sits around that. And um, whenever anyone forgets to include computing in their head when they're thinking about chips, uh, you can count on me to wave my phone and say, these aren't made out of bamboo, right? Uh, so, I mean, we have a huge role to play there. Um, there is a PCAST uh, working group. So PCAST is the Presidential Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And PCAST is coming out with a report related to this field. They have um, written a letter to the president that summarizes some of their key ideas. And so they're talking about uh, the research part of the space, including noting um, the way in which the design ecosystem, which goes broader than just semiconductor fab, is important. Um, in that big chip side of the bill, NSF is in there with $200 million of appropriations for semiconductor workforce funding. And that's real appropriations. Um, and so NSF is working on a spend plan for those appropriations that's due back at the end of October. The and science part of the bill has NSF it, uh, in it in a big way. The and science part of the bill sort of reshapes different aspects of um, how NSF and other federal agencies might engage in science research funding. Uh, a lot of the and science part of the bill comes out of this long set of discussions that we've had over the past three years, and this Frontier Act, NSF for the Future Act, all these things that were in discussion. If you count up everything that's on the and science part of it, NSF is listed for over 80 billion with a B dollars of authorization language. Um, but here's our civics lesson. <laughs> authorization says NSF is allowed to spend up to X. Authorization does not appropriate X, right? So um, that gap from authorization to appropriation is what we see on the and science side of things. So we're still working out which parts of that, you know, there's parts of it that we have to do regardless of appropriations. But that side of the bill, um, we're still sorting out uh, literally line by line um, how to implement it. Um, but the key thing to know about the and science part is this gap between authorization and appropriations. Does that help? The the two hundred million of appropriations, like I said, the spend plan is due in a month and a half, and so that's that's all we know right now. Yeah. Okay. 